This is Medieval, Middle Eastern Ceramics, and this lecture is about Iran, uh, focusing in this case on the clay earthenware bodied wares. There will be a subsequent lecture on the stone face bodied wares. So Iran is, of course, around here somewhere. So Iran, in this case, is greater than the nation-state, um, probably even greater than um, the concept of Persia, because it includes Trans-Oxiania. Here's the Oxus, and this is the trans side of it, the other side of it. And so cities like Samarkand are a part of this, and Nishapur, which is inside um, Ir modern Iran, because the Medieval borders didn't necessarily reflect the modern borders. But there's also important material from Siraf and Sirjan here, and places around here, which will be another map. This is a, a site called Zhurjan. So as you can see, this is the state of things um, in the 10th century, say. The Samanids were ruling what we call Khorasan quite often, which includes not just modern Khorasan, which is a province of northern Iran, but the large areas of Afghanistan and Transoxiania. So it's all um, one political unit in this, this time. The technology um, and styles of the pottery are quite distinctive in some cases. In some cases, there's a certain unity across the entire region. And of course, a bit later on, we get the Seljuks who unite this entire region. So, as I said, one of these sites is a site called Nishapur in northeast Iran, which was a massively important city on the Silk Road and very wealthy and was the site of very early excavations by a team from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York under Charles Wilkinson. And here we have a picture of the excavations in 1939. This is the area of early medieval Nishapur. Uh, this is the Tell, which was the site of the excavations. Uh, Nishapur was destroyed by the Mongols in about 1221, and when they rebuilt the city, they rebuilt it over here, the site of modern Nishapur. So I can see there's a couple of kiln finds here. Uh, it's actually the east kilns were used when this was a city. So it probably wasn't a densely occupied city, and the eastern er areas of it um, included in this green blob may have included some of these less pleasant industries. This one is actually the 15th century kilns when the city was over here. Because this is the wind rose, so the wind's going in this direction. So from these excavations, we actually have pottery from Basra in Iraq. And we have the blue painted wares like this. Uh, so the tin of pacified glaze with cobalt blue only made at Basra, not made anywhere else in the world at the time. But they did copy them. But this is a white slip over a sort of pinkish earthenware body and a black slip paint, probably with chromium in it as well as slip, and splashed with, with green as some of the imports from Iraq would look like. There are also luster wares so here again is a, a nice luster ware from Basra, uh, the only place that would be making luster wares of this style. In fact, the only place making luster wares at this time. And locally, they also copied them again. So here you can see this green tinge, possibly iron under reducing conditions, uh, coloring it. So this green tinge is meant to copy the luster paint. And it's actually quite a good uh, rendition of a luster design and very nicely done. 
So you can see that the ability, the artistic ability to make luster wares was certainly widespread. It was the technological ability that was lacking. And uh, Nishapur is one of those sites I talk about when I say they copied luster wares and they make very good copies of them in their local technology. But um, they're still constrained by certain aspects of their motor habit patterns. So when they're throwing the bowls, even if they're trying to copy a Basra bowl, they will be doing things like having feet that work in exactly the same way that they always have in that part of the world. So when I say, I believe the forming tradition of Basra is then found in Fustat, this is what I'm talking about because they, they do not seem capable or disinclined to copy precisely uh, the forms that are made in Basra. Uh, this is something you only dis discern if you draw the pottery. So all the art historians who just vaguely look at a bowl and say, oh, it is of this shape, actually are not making any contribution to the work. So here's uh, another slip painted ware. So again, it's a, a pink body, a white oval slip, and then it's covered with slip paint. So this is a clay medium paint. Um, there is iron rich red bits and blacker bits, this probably would be more clearer, um, and has an overall lead glaze. So these will often be together, the lead glaze and the slip paint. See, this one looks a bit clearer because the, the lead glaze is better preserved. This is probably more of a local style. It's actually interesting that they have this technology quite quickly. And I remember seeing once in, I think, Tashkent, uh, shards of Sogdian pottery that is, is what the region would, would have been politically before Islam. And um, they have these little shards were slip painted lead glazed pottery. So it's possible this is a continuation of a pre-Islamic style, but I haven't seen any publication for it. It is also possible that these are mis they were mislabeled shards of early Islamic pottery, but this is a very distinctive style. There are a number of distinctive slip painting styles from this part of the world, and it would not surprise me if there was an indigenous underglaze, slip painted lead glaze tradition uh, that existed, because after all, the lead glaze tradition was known on both ends of the Silk Road it went straight through Samarkand and Nishapur. So that there was a connection and possibly the technology was known along that connection would not be un an unreasonable hypothesis. And they also had these very beautiful things, uh, these very beautiful birds with these very long, elegant tails. And so again, this has no relationship to other influences from other regions. Um, in the Islamic world. There's nothing of the Basra influence on this. This is a, a beautiful indigenous style of um, depicting in a stylistic way the, these, uh, these birds and probably has a lot more to do with, with the local indigenous styles of decoration, which may be well known in other media that we do not have so well preserved. Another interesting style is this. Uh, Charles Wilkinson, the excavator of Nishapur, calls this buff wear because the, the clay is, is a buff colored uh, wear, but uh, I call it yellow field wear. But it does seem to be only found or made at Nishapur. Um, as you can see, it is again a slip painted wear and it has the field is colored uh, yellow. I think possibly by antimony, but I haven't, I don't think I've actually been able to prove that yet. Um, but the rest of this is, is slip painted. 
Now these have some very nice things, lots of birds, lots of birds and animals with a very distinctive style. This piece is in the ROM, so I feel constrained to, to share it with you. Uh, and again, has no relationship to influences from Iraq, possibly either indigenous or possibly influences from, uh, from the plains and the Silk Road. Uh, this looks like a very nice gentleman with beautiful long black hair, um, sitting rather like you would depict the Buddha in those pre-Islamic uh, wall paintings in this part of the world from the pre-Islamic times. And here's a nice lady again with lovely long black hair and again lots of birds. This is again in the ROM, and I'm showing it to you, not because it's just in the ROM, but because he's an awesome chap. There he is, galloping along with his sword in one hand, and possibly a bird in the other. Uh, the bird goes all the way around, as it is uh, traditional in this style, and I like to think it actually depicts the bird leaving his hand, flying around, and coming back. Or maybe not, I don't know. So this, this is probably the most interesting style um, or depictions on this this group of, of yellow field wares. And that is a group that has these animal-headed humans running around. Now this is clearly nothing to do with Islam. And if this has any relationship, it looks like some sort of shamanism. Um, this is, shamanism is a, a term, if any of you are anthropologists, you have heard of it. Uh, it's a widespread term used for um, more traditional religions that deal with spirit worlds and this sort of thing, and also dealing with animals and being possessed by the spirit of animals in some way or something like that. Um, and you often have animal-headed depictions. And you get shamanism all around the world, this wearing animal masks, wearing animal headdresses, and it goes right back to very early times. Um, those of you who have taken the archaeology of stuff might remember the deer-headed masks found at Mesolithic Star Car in England. Um, and my, my showing you images of shaman in Scandinavia and across Northern Asia um, that do this sort of thing. And also you get it in uh, the steppe peoples. Uh, the Scythians will have things like this on some of their art. So this probably reflects an ancient steppe culture of shamanism which would have still been uh, active in this time. But here you can see again the beautiful long hair and what may in fact be a headdress on top of what is a human leaping around doing shamany things. So also at Nishapur they seem to be making these lovely slip and sized splash painted wares. So this is a universal, um, possibly influenced by China. This one particularly looks like it's influenced by Chinese uh, pottery. And so uh, again, this is a style that if they have the technology, they certainly have the influence and they will make this sort of thing. So these are one of the styles you get all over Iran at this time, being about the 10th century. Yeah. So this one, also attributed to, to Nishapur, but uh, not certain. They're, they're, this would actually be a, a useful thesis. People have actually asked me if I could do this, but it never seemed to work out, which is distinguishing between production centers for this kind of pottery. And I have done some petrographic analysis and the, the way of incising through the slip paint, I would actually associate with Samarkand. But since I can't thin section this piece, because it's like whole, I, I can't test that. But uh, with a greater sample size, it might be possible to say that with more surety. 
So here are two of these major centers. Here's Nishapur with a slit painted ware. And here is Samarkand with another slit painted ware. Very different fabrics. It would be very easy to distinguish between the Nishapur filled with uh, volcanic rocks and the Samarkand filled with uh, a fine silty sediment appropriate to the broad um, alluvial plain that it's built upon. And here is Samarkand on the broad alluvial plain that it's built upon. Uh, the, the, this is actually a minor course, here's, here's another one, and there are very large rivers not far away, and this is a, a, a big alluvial plain, and probably uh, there is the occasional outcropping here, this is a hill over here. This is what is called nowadays Afrasia, and is where ancient and early medieval Samarkand was. There is a, a higher area here, in fact a number of fortifications going around it, but probably this entire area was occupied in uh, pre-Mongol times. But then the Mongols came along and killed everybody. So then they rebuilt the city to, to the south, and this became the heart of, of the new city of Samarkand. And when this becomes the capital of the empire of Timur in the 15th century, this is, this is the city that he built down here. And so by that time, this was a graveyard. And there's some very important tombs here, like Shah Zinda. I'll show you pictures of that when we get to the to Morids. Um, but in later, like 19th century maps, this is covered with the symbols that it's a graveyard. And this is the city. Um, Samarkand has such a romantic sound to it. And it's somewhere I remember in my youth that I thought, I'd love to go to Samarkand. It sounds so beautiful and far away. But I've been there and it's a dump. It's like, it was completely destroyed by the, Roshan, by the Russians. Um, the walls of which the, these are taken by someone who's been doing research on the citadel and, and trying to figure out where the walls have all gone. Um, and most of the city was, was um, turned into a Soviet satellite city, although there are some traces of the jewels of architecture of the Timurid period. So excavations by uh, a French team in Afrasia have found evidence for pottery manufacture. Um, the, these, these are like uh, turntables and they were found in a uh, in a kiln site, so they were probably a turntable for, for forming pottery on. Um, and these are, of course, kiln furniture used for separating the pottery during the firing. Um, and this is obviously a waster. So I've never sampled this, but I have sampled quite a lot of potteries from Samarkand, uh, mostly from the 15th century, although a few earlier ones. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what that looks like. And here is a, another piece from the excavations. And you can see the, the incision through the, uh, the slip paint. Uh, so this seems to be more common at Samarkand. And any one I have thin sectioned is also of the Samarkand body. But there's all sorts of other um, styles which would be more difficult to discern. Um, so it's quite an interesting group but they certainly seem to be very beautifully done with lots of different colors of slip. And also slip in size wares and splash painted wares, of course. Very, and you can see how splash painting is, is probably a bit of a misnomer, misnomer in this case, as it often is. Um, it's the runniness of, of the lead glaze that makes these colors run, but in this case, they don't seem to run very much. Here, here's like a more runnier one. So again, this the slip and size wear is, uh, is, is quite an important group. And here is another beautiful calligraphic example with, with the incision to refine and define those lines. So other places, Sir John. Uh, I, I thin sectioned some pottery from Sir John uh, in southern Iran. Again, a distinctive fabric, again with 
splash painted slip and size wares and with um, slip painted wares this, this will be a dark slip on, on the, over a white slip and also this type of slip painted wear with these little round things on and I call this medallion wear and so this seems to be made of the fabric that seems to be from Sir John um, which we shall get to in a minute and there is seraph again uh, slip painted uh, slip painted splash painted wares and this is another fabric with another distinctive uh, another uh, splash wear with a distinctive Iranian fabric so there's there's a lot of variability there's, there's, Iran is geologically a very variable place and so it would be possible to really work up the distribution of uh, the different clay bodied wares. So here I'm going to talk about some of these uh, wares from the north. Here's Damgan, Zhurj, uh, hang on, Sari, Amul, Avkand, the Garris district. So Garris is in the town, it's just an area. And Zhurjan. And so all of these places have pottery associated with them, or I've sampled pottery like it, Damgan. Um, and so um, they're of importance. So here is what is known in the literature as sari ware, um, associated with the town of Sari, which I just told you where that was. And I call it medallion ware because it's a very distinctive style and it isn't necessarily made at Sari. In fact, as I just showed you, um, it's, it's made in other centers, certainly in southern Iran. Uh, but it has these medallion styles all over it, the little round things, big round things, and the white dots. So it's the white dots on the black lines um, that particularly distinguish, or, or green bands, but basically white dots, slip painted, lead glaze, um, make this quite a distinctive style. So, I'm going to be quoting directly from uh, my book here. There's actually a component in the online version of Shine Like the Sun that goes into and has more examples of these uh, Iranian wares. Um, but Fahravari, the author, you know, to find this reference, go to the book, uh, considers sari wares to be from the 10th and 11th centuries based on unpublished stratigraphic evidence from a site called Tamisha, which is very difficult to prove. But it does seem to have nothing to do with early Iranian luster wares. So I think 10th century would work uh, quite well. Here's a nice one. As you can see, they like birds. Lots of birds, another distinctive aspect of this wear. And here's another one that I thin sectioned. So you can see here is probably the tail of a bird. So this is a very obviously sari style uh, piece um, of medallion wear, as I like to call it. And again, it's another fabric. Uh, I often, if I have like a, a bunch of pottery, I will call them Georgian one, in this example, Georgian one, two, and three doesn't mean they're made there it means that's where they were sampled quite often um, the first one is one I'm interested in so if I was thin section a lot of pottery from Georgian and they included luster wares probably the first thing I would define would be a luster wear and that would be Georgian one but in this case it's this and here's Georgian two and three and here's a slip painted wear and here's a splash slip and sized wear and again, they are distinctive fabrics, but I don't know which one is actually local. I think it might be this one. I think it was more common. Here's another style uh, related to the city of Arkand. Um, I call this the incised outline. It's a, it's a slip incised wear, and it will often, the incision will outline the design, as you can clearly see. Um, so slip paint, it's isolated between incised lines, or the splash paint in this case. And so this, again quoting from the book, 
is actually very like um, Luster Wears from Egypt and probably more likely the first group of Iranian Luster Wears. And that would make them um, either right at the end of the 11th or early 12th centuries. And here's another nice one. Um, this is a very Fatimid style of design, the, 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 the little uh, leafy thing inside a scroll with the knobbly bits off the side. So it might be it's influenced directly from, from, uh, from Egypt or something very common at that style. And don't forget one important aspect of this is you don't need pottery to go around influencing each other. There's a lot of other media which actually travel better than pottery. So it would be possible that they saw this, this entire design perhaps, on a textile, which has now long rotted away. And here's another one, again, slightly Fatimidi style of, of decoration. Again, could have been from a textile that they picked it up. But here you can see this, this deer is having trouble with this dog. And here this, this goat uh, clearly has no trouble with, with dogs, probably saw it off. Here's another group associated with the city of Amul. Um, how about that again? That is, I have no idea. At the stage, I have not sampled one of these, so I don't even know if they're consistently the same. So I um, call this the green painted and incised, just making stuff up, uh, because it's green, typically green, or sometimes brown uh, paint, and it has this scribbly incision so again, it's got an overall slip and incision through the slip. So it's a slip and sized style um, with this scribbling infill and then green paint between the, uh, the, the lines. So forms and motifs of this group appear to most closely par paralleled by Iranian luster groups three and four. So that would suggest a late 12th century date. And here's a very nice one, big eagle on it or something. And here's, just, just to show you there are other forms once in a while, is this basin-y thing. Then we come to Garrus Ware. So Garrus is again um, a, a place that this pottery is associated with, although how reliable this is, is neither here nor there probably, but it's, it's not actually reliable. Um, this is a slip excised wear, and so this is covered with an overall slip, and then the slip is excised, it's cut off, not just incised like this, but excised, so just calling it slip excised wear worked quite well. Um, so this again is very like early luster wares. And so that would suggest a date in the first half of the 12th century. And again, here is a nice big eagly bird, very, very, very popular. And this one's in the ROM. There's also a broken one in the ROM. Oh no, this isn't it. This is another one from Freer with like this, looks like a bulldog with a human head or something. And this is a, a broken one in the ROM, which I thin sectioned with large lumps of limestone in it. And again, it's a distinctive fabric. So every one I look at these seems to be a very distinctive. And it'd be really quite easy to start working out where these things are made and distinguishing between them um, if anyone ever felt like it. And that concludes this lecture. Thank you.